risen. Katie is risen. risen. <laughs> the last Sunday that we can say that. Um, it's been a wonderful, joyous season of Pascha. Um, I know I'm energized every time I hear that proclaimed at church multiple times in multiple languages. So as we're coming to the, the conclusion of that season, we pray that the grace of Pascha has been wonderful for all of you who are our regular attendees. So it's great to be together again on our uh, latest episode of Becoming Byzantine. Um, let's begin, as all things we should, with a prayer. So Father Deacon Anthony, would you lead us in prayer, please? Certainly. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, who everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of blessings, bestower of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all that defiles us, and O oh, good one, save our souls. Amen. Well, good to be with everyone again. Thank you for attending. Thank you for being with us. Um, we are three right now. Hopefully, Father Michael Wynn will join us a little bit later on. It's good to see Father Daniel and Father Deacon Anthony again. And just by way of reminder, um, Father Daniel Dozier is kind of the brains behind this operation, uh, this wonderful ministry, which, gosh, it feels like we've, we started about a year ago, I think. We've been, go we've been going we're, strong. We're, it's pretty close. We're moving yeah. in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, been, it's been a ride. It's been a ride. So Father Daniel is a priest of the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix for the Ruthenian Catholic Church. Um, do check out his book on Eastern Catholicism, published by Catholic Answers Press. Uh, that is our prize, which we've given out for a solid year, and no one's complained yet. Um, so it's it's a wonderful, wonderful, handy little book with a second a second volume coming out soonish, right, Father Daniel? Uh, in well, the works, the, anyway. It's something in the works, yeah. So on on holy oh. orders. So excellent. Uh, yeah, which will be, which has been a lot of fun to research and write, and actually been really, for me, a great spiritual meditation on uh, on on ordained ministry. So excellent. We need more of those resources as Eastern Catholics. So do keep them coming. So thank you for being with us, Father Daniel. My and of course, and of course, uh, Father Deacon Anthony Dragani, um, also our regular panelist, the uh, the webmaster of the very very helpful. Eastern Catholic resource, easttowest.org. There, I just posted that link in the chat. A wonderful resource. Um, it's helped a lot of people understand the theology of the East in terms of an introduction and even getting into some of those more deep questions like clerical celibacy and married priesthood and things like that. He's got some great stuff that's helped me to kind of parse through those issues. So good to have you with us again, Father Deacon Anthony. Thank you, Robert. It's always a joy. And of course, we hope to have Father Michael Wynn with us uh, very shortly, uh, the English language editor of Christ Our Pascha, the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism, which is what we're going through. Uh, Father Michael was traveling, so he might have some travel de delays, but we hope that he'll be with us soon. If not, um, we will do the best we can. Um, we'll, we'll muddle through. So it's, it's good to have everyone with us again. And of course, we're missing... Bianca as well, who is our wonderful uh, show producer. I'm sure she's uh, very busy with her uh, motherly duties. Um, I know that keeps my wife very busy. I hear my kids in the background. So it's, it's always craziness in family life, which is a, a, a blessed craziness. So, so you think um, the sound canceling headphones you can hear? You yes. Can, you can hear the kids. Wow, that's incredible. That's great. I do have six of them. I do have six. So they tend to resonate. Um, <laughs> so uh, just by way of housekeeping announcements, this series is co-sponsored by the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Phoenix and Vineyard of the Lord Catholic Ministries. So we're very grateful for our sponsors. And we're very grateful to you who have ridden with us on this ride through the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism for a better part of a year now. Thank you for being with us. We rely on your help, your support, um, the fact that you show up on a regular basis to be with us and you know donate an hour and a half of your Sunday evening to engage the, the Eastern Catholic faith is inspiring to us. So thank you for being here with us. Um, we do rely on 
donations to keep this wonderful ministry going. So I'm going to post a link in the chat and you probably have heard my spiel before. Go to it's Father Daniel's parish page, but if you drop down, there's a little box that says donate to becoming Byzantine. All that goes to keeping this wonderful ministry going. So anything you can give is very, very much appreciated. Also, if you want to spread the work of the Becoming Byzantine series, what really, really helps as I'm learning more and more about the way YouTube works is the more people that go to our YouTube page um, and view our videos, leave a like, subscribe, click the little bell for notifications so that when we post a new video, you get notified right away. Um, it really helps with making our channel more popular making sure people who go onto YouTube who are looking for Eastern Catholic information, they see our stuff first because we've had a lot of visitors to the site. And it also gives you an opportunity to grab a link and post it on your social media so that your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues can be introduced to this work that we're trying to do. And again, we're trying to introduce Eastern Catholicism um, to you um, as an act of love, as an act of uh, really fulfilling Christ's command to go into all the world and preach the good news. Uh, so we're doing it through this digital medium. So we hope that you're enjoying the ride. Tonight, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, this portion of the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism is on the time and space of the church's prayer, uh, both public prayer and private prayer. Um, what we're going to be covering tonight spans Christ our Pascha 533 to 703. So a lot of ground to be chewed on this evening. So we will do the best that we can, given the amount of content that we're going to cover. So, but it's all really good stuff. So by all means, if you have a question during our presentations, during our discussion, feel free to post it in the chat and we will try to get to questions as time permits. So again, start thinking about prayer um, and questions on prayer that you might have, and we will be happy to get to those. All right, this first segment on uh, visible and invisible prayer in our liturgical life, uh, Christ our Pascha 533 to 536. Um, this is something in this kind of introduction to prayer. Uh, it's a topic that we've, we've talked about before. The importance of the admixture of the visible and the tangible, right, um, and the invisible. You know, I know we've talked about it before with liturgy, that commingling of heaven and earth, right? So we need those tangible signs in order to draw us earthly people heavenward. So that's what this first portion of the catechism talks about. So Father Deacon Anthony, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the importance of our understanding of the invisible realm, right? We talk a lot about the signs, the symbols, the iconography, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but what's the importance of our Christian understanding of the invisible? Yeah, so in our culture today, there's a tendency to focus on what's visible and tangible. And um, <clears throat> many people take it as a given even that all that exists is what we can see, feel, and touch. But when you approach life that way, you're missing out on, on, on a lot. Uh, in a sense, you're missing out on everything, really. People have a hard time understanding this, but I think a great analogy, sorry, <coughs> allergies, weather change. I think a great analogy is one proposed long ago by the great philosopher Plato. In his book, The Republic, he gives the famous uh, allegory of the cave. Now imagine that you have a group of people who spend their entire lives living in a cave, facing a blank wall. Behind them, there's a fire, and all they see is shadows you know, from the outside world on this blank wall in front of them, and they think that that's all that exists. Um, I think that describes how we live our lives, in a sense. All we're seeing is shadows of greater realities. You know, The physical, the material is important, obviously, but it's really only the tip of a much greater reality. And I think that a lot of the world doesn't make sense, really, unless you understand the, the spiritual existence, or the reality of a spiritual realm. I think things happen all the time that are spiritual in nature, 
and they may not make a lot of sense. I mean, why is it, for example, that whenever evil governments take over a country, the first thing they often do is go after Christians or Catholics? Why is that? Why are we always the target? <clears throat> things of that nature. You know, um, I think a lot of things are happening under spiritual influences, and we can't see this. We can't understand it. We can't grasp it. All we have are little tidbits here and there, and we have the liturgy. The liturgy is the church's vehicle to make the intangible tangible, the invisible visible. That's what we've got. Uh, but the truth is, unless we recognize there's more to this world than what we can see, feel, and touch, uh, we're kind of, how should I put it, we're kind of flying blind, literally, um, because we're missing out on what's really going on. Yeah. Wonderful. Father Daniel, anything you'd like to add? Well, I, I think uh, just to build on what Father Deacon said, you, you know, it goes back to creation, right? We profess in, uh, in the symbol of Nicaea, uh, Constantinople, you know, that, uh, that uh, God created the world visible and invisible. Uh, there are these realities, and we know from creation uh, that there are the angelic powers, for instance. Um, and those angelic powers, they have both, both fallen and unfallen <laughs> Uh, and uh, and they're very active, and you know these are the um, these are those is part of those invisible realities, those realms that we may experience in different ways, but don't necessarily see with the visible eye unless we're given a particular grace in that moment to uh, to do so. And there are many examples in the lives of the saints uh, where that has occurred. At the same time, uh, there are also examples. Um, I, I'm, I think it's Father, Ar is it Arsene? Father Arsene. Uh, there's, a, I think, a, a story where he has a vision of the liturgy, and it just sort of opens up to him, you know, the whole spiritual realm of what's happening. And liturgically, you know, like the Cherubic Hymn, I was meditating on it today when I was uh, uh, celebrating the liturgy, you know, this Cherubic Hymn and all the angelic powers. And then, you know, we, when we start singing, you know, holy, holy, holy from the prophecy of Isaiah, and, and you have this sense of we're participating in something that is greater than ourselves, that is greater than the visible realm. And we see the manifestation of the invisible, especially in the lives of the saints and, and in the liturgy. As human beings, the fact that we are material and spiritual, um, you know, God works with us through the material, but he does it to sort of uh, give us a, a doorway, a gateway into the invisible uh, realms and participation there as well so so yeah that's it's it's really a matter of faith uh but at the same time there are plenty of examples of experiences that people have had with, with the invisible as well yeah and and part of that at least something that's been resonating in my mind recently part of that process of theosis is we become more sensitive to the invisible around us you know, um, you know, we live in a very mucky and dirty and, you know, evil generation. I mean, that's been, you know, all of human history. So it can be really difficult through all that fog and that haze to see God at work. But the more we cooperate with God's grace, the more we're able to see those rays of light, um, even in our own times, in our own culture. They're there, but they're, mm -hmm. they can be difficult to see. And it also, just to add on to that a bit, yeah. you know, when you look at the world through spiritual eyes, through a spiritual lens, um, you begin to see that, that a lot of the major events going on in the world have a spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. we tend to reduce everything down to politics and people making decisions. I think there are spiritual influences, both good and bad, yeah. at work all around us. Now, one thing I'm just going to point out, uh, this struck me in the past month, you know, to go with the current event. As we're all aware, a, a draft opinion was leaked from the Supreme Court about Roe v. Wade hopefully being overturned. This you know, Supreme Court decision, which legalized abortion up to nine months and resulted in millions and millions and millions of death, deaths. Now, you can look at that through a political lens. We can also look at what's going on through a spiritual lens as well. Um, every ancient culture, uh, when they'd reach a point of darkness, human sacrifice would typically be where they went. And often, more often than not, it was a sacrifice of children, mm -hmm. especially infants. You know, child sacrifice, infant sacrifice was a major thing in a lot of corrupt cultures in the ancient world. Um, demonic entities, you know, in, in the Old Testament would, would demand this. They would require this. There's something in a spiritual realm that wants to see the infants 
uh, die, wants to see the death of the innocents. So this draft opinion comes out. Uh, immediately, the fiercest, most vicious, most angry people decide to attack Catholic churches. You know, they start threatening churches. Uh, one of their leaders said that they should storm a church and uh, desecrate the Eucharist. Um, now, the Catholic Church, yeah, we're a moral voice in this culture, but we're not the ones who make the decision, are we? But yet, we're target number one next to certain Supreme Court justices. Why is that? Is it coming from these people's minds, or is there a spiritual influence at work? I can't help but think there are uh, spiritual forces at play here. Yeah, and you saw that today in the epistle reading uh, as well with Paul and Silas and uh, absolutely it was following them that she was possessed by a spirit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Paul discerned that he tolerated it for a while. <laughs> He'd had enough, you know, at some point. So uh, there is this recognition, you know, of this invisible realm uh, and and the need and, and, you know, he, he talks about this in one of his epistles that, you know, we're not battling against flesh and blood but against the, the powers and principalities of the air. I mean, this is, this is a, uh, a, a reality that I think Christians should be attuned to. Part of the problem, though, is, you know, you think about, like, even the holy angels. We have this sort of sentimentalized view of the angelic powers, the pink butt cherubs, you know, all, all, over, the, all over the ceilings and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but when you go to, like, the apocalypse of John and... <laughs> Suddenly, you know, you're in the presence of, you know, a, a powerful archangel or, or, you know, he's tempted to fall down in worship, in adoration, because the light of God radiates so powerfully. So in a way, it's God accommodating, you know, uh, himself to us in our current state that we don't see all these things, because it probably would be quite, quite overwhelming if we, if we did see all, all of those uh, angels or were aware, intensely aware of visibly of their of their presence indeed and just to build on that a bit more i think one of the great tragedies of christianity today is there's been a tendency in a lot of churches to sidestep the invisible realm to downplay the supernatural realm and to reduce christianity to a moral code or to a set of platitudes or, or to being nice you know christianity is about being nice and i think that's caused a lot of people to leave christianity i think that's emptied a lot of churches out Oh, excellent points. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Excellent points. All right, uh, to slightly switch gears a bit, um, the Catechism talks about our routine of prayer, you know, our cycle of prayer, right? We're coming to the end of the, the Paschal cycle, right? So, and entering into a new season. Um, and this is something that our secular culture, our secular culture un understands routine. Right, we have these examples in our secular culture of, you know, here's Bezos's routine, here's Elon Musk's routine, and these really hardworking people, right, who who made themselves into a great great success. So they get the importance of routine, right, to work hard and to have a, a I guess a healthy lifestyle, quote unquote. Um, so that's the secular world. Father Daniel, what does our cycle of liturgical prayer throughout the year? Tell us about time and its importance. Okay, time and its importance. Let's see if I can do that in five minutes or less. No, I, <laughs> well, well, I think again, going back to creation, right? When when God when God made the world, uh, Moses uh, and, uh, and the Mosaic authors are are providing right in the first chapter of Genesis an understanding, a supernatural outlook on. What, what is happening in the creation of, of time and, and the world, right? God is, in essence, in those six days of creation, he's erecting a temple. And that temple is to be a dwelling place for humanity, uh, a dwelling place for uh, the animal world and all the material realms that exist. And it's also to be the dwelling place of God. Uh, so the first three days, God is erecting, constructing rooms, uh, and realms. And then on the next three days, God is uh, establishing rulers of those realms. And even within the rulers of the realms, for instance, in the, in the realm of, of light and darkness, you have the sun, moon, and stars erected on day four. Uh, that was seen as a way of calculating the liturgical calendar. 
uh, for, uh, for the Israelites. And then you have you know, the, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea ruling the realm of the, of the, uh, of the water and the air and the sky. Uh, animals that were also used in sacrifice. Also animals that were worshipped. Sun, moon, and stars were also worshipped as idols. Uh, birds and fish sometimes were, and, and the sea creatures were worshipped as, as idols as well. Then you have beasts and man inhabiting and ruling and governing the realm of the, uh, of the land and vegetation. And suddenly, you know, we see all of these creatures um, and, and time and space and, uh, and the seasons are all oriented towards the service of man and his priesthood. And it is also the dwelling place, uh, the habitation of the Lord. This is what the Sabbath means. The Sabbath means God comes to establish his kingship presence in the realm of creation. So creation time, all these things have an orientation towards God and towards the priesthood of man offering to God uh, the things that God has given. God condescends to be present among man in order to elevate man, uh, to uh, raise up praise and worship to him, to offer him creation, the creation that's been given to him, offer it back to God. So this cycle of what the what the fathers would call katabasis anabasis, you know, God's condescension anabasis in order to elevate man. This is a liturgical pattern, and what it represents is uh, the way we're meant to live our lives as as natural priests. But of course, with Christ coming, the new Adam, and God's plan unfolding in this elliptical pattern over time in salvation history, uh, where you know after. You know, God originally creates the world to be this temple, but of course we have the cosmic fall through humanity and then God's plan of redemption unfolding as we talked about in the earlier chapters of the catechism. Uh, that elliptical pattern is a way of God revealing through repetition, uh, revealing his divine plan, his, his economia, his, his divine economy, the way he governs and he adjusts and adapts his governance uh, based upon our growth and maturity. Well, now with the coming of Christ, the new priest, the new high priest, we have a new priesthood being established, that of the order of Melchizedek, offering to God uh, both uh, sacramentally uh, the, uh, the created gifts of bread and wine and, and through the use of oil and water and all the natural goods of things that were given to us by God that have now been uh, suffused with this supernatural grace, these energies of God now that transform and heal us and restore us back to our, our glory, um, but now our glory in Christ, all these things become part of God's ultimate plan to bring us into communion with him and to dwell with us, to be Emmanuel, God with us. So the whole world has become a temple again where God dwells with us. So that becomes the term, determining factor of how we orient uh, our, our day and our week. Um, so, so when we think about time and its purpose, where, where, what is its, what is its end goal? What is the end, the end state? The end state we read in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of John is to be in that eternal day with the Lord, where we don't need, uh, a sun, uh, to light the earth or a moon to light the, you know, at, and during the day or a moon to light the earth at night, God will be that sun. God will be that light of the world. And, uh, and so our, our whole day, that eternal day, will be oriented to living in the presence of God. But during our time now, that we need to experience it in ways that God accommodates himself to our limited uh, uh, availability and the duties of our life. And so we have to find times of prayer to enter into that eternal day in a temporal way for the time being. And so we do that through... The horologion, for instance, the hours of prayer throughout the day. We do that through the liturgical seasons, uh, where we have this re repetition, this pattern where we are immersed in sacred events pertaining to the redemption of Christ and, uh, and to the mother of God and all the saints. It's that constant repetition where we, we are no longer just remembering, we're participating in this. Uh, our, our life in Christ now becomes visible and experienced through the festal calendar and the, and the fasts and all these things. So this rhythm is one that's meant to help us participate more fully in that redemption, in that new creation that leads ultimately to, to the eternal day mentioned by John in Revelation. So I'll, I'll pause here, but that's, that, that would be one way to kind of consider the meaning of time and, and how it, it relates to our prayer.
Well, that's, that's excellent. And also a very good segue to zooming in a bit specifically on Sunday, mm -hmm. right? Because Sunday, you know, the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection, the eight, we call it the eighth day, the day of new creation. We have so many different ways to talk about Sunday. And yet, so many of us get caught in the rut of, well, I went to church on Sunday, done, I checked that box, and then the rest of the day is, you know, hopefully family time. That's a good way to spend it. Um, but for some people, it's drinking beer and watching football. Nothing wrong with relaxing on a Sunday. But, you know, we've lost a sense of sacredness for the whole of the day of Sunday. So I thought, Father Deacon Anthony, can you give us some pointers as to how to reclaim the sacredness of Sunday? Yeah, I, I think that it all begins with the individual and it begins with the family and setting priorities. That's the key thing. Um, there's this company that I like to buy stuff from who specialize in electronics. Uh, they're like a photo company. They make photo, photo equipment, but also they make computer parts and they sell them in a big store. They're owned by Orthodox Jews. And they make a point of never taking orders on the Sabbath, which for them, you know, is Friday evening into Saturday. And they lose a lot of business, I'm sure, because of this. You know, they will not take orders during the Sabbath. Um, but man, I really respect that. I really respect that because they're making it clear that following God's laws, we understand it is the number one priority, it takes precedence over business. It takes precedence over sales. And uh, for many of us on the Christian side of things, we've totally forgotten the importance of the Sabbath, which is for us a Sunday. Uh, those of us who even go to church on Sunday are the minority of Christians, I'm afraid. Uh, but beyond that, it's become like any other day. And that, that saddens me. Uh, but we have to make priorities. We have to set priorities. Uh, I'll give you an example. So a number of years back, uh, my, my oldest daughter, Izzy, uh, wanted to be a cheerleader. So she joined, you know, cheerleading in her elementary school and they'd go to flag football games and cheer. And it was a really awesome thing. She really loved it. She got really good at it. She did it for a couple of years, but the last year she was doing it, um, they decided to change the schedule of games. Uh, I'm not sure why, but all the schools in the area who were part of the league got together, changed the schedule. So most of the games were on Sunday mornings or early Sunday afternoons, whereas before they were primarily on Saturdays. And... <sighs> This bothered me. This bothered me that they expected all these families to be there with the, the little boys playing football and the little girls cheering for them, you know, 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. And uh, this became a huge problem for us, huge. And Izzy and I sat down and I said, Izzy, you know, they've changed the schedule around. This seems to be the new trend. Everything's on Sunday mornings. Uh, I'm not going to tell you you have to quit um, because she could write with her friend if she had to, right? But I want to explain the situation. What do you want to do? Now, I knew what I wanted her to do, right? But I felt it was important that she, this was coming from her. And she said, Dad, she said, I'd much rather be in church than be cheering at a football game. I was very happy about that. She got the message. Yeah. Um, but sadly, our culture has forgotten the message. It's become like any other day. So we can't turn the tide of the culture, but we can make choices as individuals and as families uh, to set priorities. And I think that's where we begin. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah. Very good. What about you, Robert? How, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, one simple thing that we do on Sunday um, is, I mean, we do take it easy at home. You know, we go to church, we're, you know, we have nine o'clock uh, Orthros and then 1030 Divine Liturgy. So, you know, we're all in church for, you know, the better part of four hours. So that knocks, not, knocks me out. You know, the kids are full of energy, so they're fine when they come home, but I'm exhausted. Um, but what I try to do is make sure during the week, Friday, Saturday, that I've pre-made enough food so that on Sunday, our meals are, are easy, right? We usually take them to, you know, together. We might have, you know, um, but, you know, we try to get together around the dinner table, but it's the cooking's done, right? We're, we're eating, you know, either leftovers from the week or something I've prepared ahead of time just to, you know, so I'm not running around the kitchen or Andre's not running around the kitchen, you know, busy about Sunday dinner, 
uh, you know, pulling her hair out because she's got the baby at her, at her feet and crying, you know. So we try to make Sunday about peace and calm and just kind of relax. It's a good day. I, I catch up with my dad, um, you know, give him a call. So we do the best we can. It is difficult in family, you know, with family life because everything is so changeable all the time. But we do the best we can to keep it, keep it peaceful, keep it quiet. So. All right. Well, well I actually, I was going to yeah. say one, one of the things that um, that our parish has done, it was one of the reasons I, when my wife and I were considering moving out to the Pacific Northwest, we came to this parish and uh, I, I uh, actually, I came visiting first and people stayed, you know, after liturgy, the people stayed about two to three to four hours afterwards. <laughs> And they all hung out together and the kids were out in the field playing games and they're, you know, we've got like seven acres. So we've got like room to run and play. And, and I said, they, they like each other. They like to stay and talk and play. And, and I went, this is, this is leisure. This is what leisure looks like. And sometimes, you know, we've got some are musically inclined. They'll bring instruments and, you know, we have little, little concerts going off on the side. I mean, it's, and I look at that and I go, this is redeeming the time, you know, what a, what a great way to, to take Sunday and, uh, and just, you know, just enjoy the resurrection of Christ. So anyway, I, 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 I think it's, it's wonderful when parishes can, can have something like that when they're kids that can get together and play and just enjoy themselves, yep. enjoy each other's company, as opposed to, you know, almost running each other over in the parking lot, trying to get out to, you know, back to home to get the Denny's for the, uh, you know, this, the two for one special or whatever it is. So I think that's an important thing, an important point. You know, there's something to be said for spending a part of the Sabbath with the church family, right? I know that when, when, when my wife and I moved to our current city where we live, we're looking for a parish to join and we came across our current parish. And one of the things that really appealed to us is every Sunday after liturgy, Everyone goes to the social hall and they hang out, they have food, they talk, the kids play together, and it felt like a family, right? And that's one of the reasons why we joined that particular parish, where currently is one of the parishes I'm assigned to. So um, I think we as Christians often forget the importance of community. And, you know, Sunday can be a great day to build community as yeah. brothers and sisters in Christ. Excellent point. Very, very important. Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've had many wonderful conversations with fellow parishioners over a lukewarm cup of coffee, you know, after divine liturgy, where you just take that time to connect, you know, and to unwind with, with the people that you've just worshipped with, which is important. All right, before we move on to our next segment, I have to ask one more question, because I just wrote a paper on this topic. Um, so I want to see if our panelists give an answer that's within the realm of what I wrote. Um, it's about the importance of the divine office in parish life, right? Um, many of our parishes um, don't offer uh, Vespers during the week or on Saturday evening. Uh, they don't offer morning, you know, uh, morning prayer on Sunday. Um, and it's a loss, because as the catechism says, you know, the divine office is, it, it kind of builds up to Sunday, right? So many, many Byzantine Christians have never seen Vespers or morning prayer or done any of the little hours at home. So I, I guess to either of our panelists, um, what is the importance of the divine office as, uh, as a way to accentuate our Sunday worship? Well, well, not to be a broken record, but it goes back to creation. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what, is, how are the days measured? You know, evening to evening, sundown to sundown, right? And um, you know, it's it's the it's that day that we honor the Lord. So for us, the Lord's Day begins Saturday evening, uh, and it's at that moment that we are entering into the praise of God. Uh, celebrating the Lord's Day. Uh, some, some parishes also have confessions after that particular time. Um, and of course, there are other hours uh, that, uh, but 
but you know, most people know, or at least are somewhat familiar with the idea of Vespers and Matins in the morning. In the morning, then you have the services and, and uh, the, the Matin or, Matins or Orthros service, uh, and then it leads right into the divine liturgy. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's a way of sanctifying the day. I mean, what's uh, part of the problem is we reduce things to this horrible category of obligatory or what's uh, what is obligatory what's an obligation what are we obligated to do you know i i it, it encourages a type of minimalism uh that's why i'm not a fan of holy days of obligation i'll just say that right up front you know or days of precept because look it's it's a day we celebrate one of the feasts of the lord to come if you can't come you can't come but but a heart that is ready uh for to welcome the feast of the lord is going to come and worship the lord and uh, I understand the idea of minimum requirements, but what it has a tendency to do is it has a tendency to reduce participation just to what I am forced to do in compliance with some legal statute. And I think the Christian heart, uh, you know, laws are for lawbreakers. The Christian heart should be more generous in its charity and love for God and neighbor to want to come and worship, you know, on those days. So what do we say? Well, we we got to get to the mass. We got to get to the, got to get the Eucharist, you know? And so, and so what do we do? We just reduce Sunday to the Eucharist. But, but to your point, Robert, there are all these other services that lead into that Eucharist. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like all of a sudden showing up, you know, at the, <laughs> showing up to a movie at the, at the peak of the of the plot, you know, just like you don't you don't get to see what happened, you know, and when you started out in the village and you started wake, working your way up to the mountain, you know, and you encounter all, you know, you're going through, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, boom, you're at the peak of the mountain, okay, boom, that's it. It's like, well, there was so much more, you know, the leading you into this day, that the, the peak experience should be the Eucharist and all the psalm prayers, everything leading up to that moment, and think about all that you're missing, all those amazing prayers. Like, for instance, a lot of people, they go and they experience Paschal Matins for Pascha. Great. You go and experience Paschal Matins. But did you know that a lot of those hymns are sung at Orthros? I mean, those, those gospels of the resurrection that we hear every Sunday, you miss that if you don't go to Orthros, if there's no Orthros service, if there's no Matin service. So it, it helps to define and shape the day. Uh, and it, it shapes our heart. You know, our hearts are meant to be shaped liturgically because as persons, we are liturgical beings. Uh, we, we're, we have a natural priesthood. And, and so we shouldn't be thinking about, we shouldn't care what the obligation is. In other words, I'm not trying to get down on obligation. We shouldn't care. We should just go, yes, the Lord is there. I want to go worship him. I don't care if it's an obligation. I'm going to go, you know, and, and even if this doesn't fulfill an obligation, I'm going to offer God my praise. And it it really does change things. We've, we've um, reintroduced Orthros into our parish cycle, and it's really been amazing, the transformation. We used to just pray third hour. Now we're, now we're doing Orthros, and now it's a, accommodated to a parochial environment, shorter uh, than you would normally have, like in a monastic environment where you got, you know, 50 monks praying, you know, and it's just a little bit tougher to do that in a parish. Eventually, we're going to reintroduce uh, Vespers. And um, but I've been trying to just sort of gradually, especially through COVID, just bring people back into this. And uh, so I'll stop talking there. And 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 uh, but that's my I, I, I yeah. think it's such an important part of our, our liturgical life. Yeah, yeah I agree 100 uh, percent. You know, so much of the theological riches are found in those services. That's where a lot of our theology is found, yeah. a lot of it. And, um, you know, I've heard people complain, well, the divine liturgy is so focused on the New Testament. Where is the Old Testament? Well, you find it in those other services. That's where the Old Testament is primarily found in our tradition. But because so many of our parishes have kind of moved away from those services, very sadly, we're lacking. We're lacking on the Old Testament dimension. We're lacking on a lot of the theology. Um, but I agree with you, Father Daniel. The idea of obligation has done tremendous, tremendous damage. Um, you know, typically obligation isn't an Eastern concept. It's something we don't inherently have in our tradition uh, because it leads to minimalism. If we say you have this obligation, the uh, people begin to think, well, okay, I have to keep the obligation or I'm going to hell or I'm going to be, you know, punished or I'm going to have a mortal sin. So I'll do whatever I have to have to, to meet the obligation, but not anything else. And that's where it typically leads. And you end up with, with, um, 
I mean, you end up with 40 minute speed liturgies. I mean, that's the logical conclusion of it, isn't it? I've seen that. I've seen parishes that do that. Um, and it's sad. It's very, very sad. Um, sadly, though, getting the idea of obligation out of our uh, vocabulary seems very difficult to do for some reason. Oh. Remember, uh, about a year ago, I was in a discussion on an online forum, and I, I suggested that maybe our calendars stop using obligation on them, right? Because that, that term's on most of our calendars, I imagine. And man, I, I, I got some pretty bad heat on that, um, most from old ladies for some reason, who are strongly attached to the idea of obligation and, and recoiled at the idea of removing that term. And I'm thinking, why? Um, we should look at these as opportunities, not obligations. Absolutely. Mm, and uh, one, one thing to add, um, because it's, it's fresh in my mind from my paper um, and from personal experience, um, you know, Father Daniel was talking about the concept of time and the sanctification of time. Um, for most of us, our Monday through Saturday is lived kind of in our secular lives. You know, we're out in the profane world. And then on Sunday, we enter into the sacred, right? Now, I'm sure there are, there are many who are much holier than I am who can go from zero to divine liturgy with just the, the right mind frame and a, a heart full of love and ready to worship, I need to build up, right? I, I need that build. I've, I've found how Sunday morning orthros, it gets, it creates that environment of prayer, right? It creates, it's like, it's an atmosphere, right? And it's, it's that air of worship that you, you breathe in deeply, that when we start divine liturgy, well, We've already been praying for an hour, hour and 20 minutes. It's, it's, it's like it resets my vocabulary to, under, to, to enter more deeply into the divine liturgy. I'm, so I'm so grateful that my parish of St. George has had that tradition of having Sunday morning orthos. I, it's been very, very, very helpful. So let's give away a book. Too much talking. Let's give away a book. We'll give you an A for that paper there, Robert. So <laughs> Just hey, tell Father Stelios. We'll pat. We'll pass it. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, let's let's give away a book so that people can uh, take more of the environment of the East into their own home. So Father Daniel, I know you don't have Bianca's. I don't. Wonderfully I, adorable algorithm of I her don't. children. So we'll do our best. All right. So uh, let's see. So if you want to, if you if you want to win the booklet, please go ahead and type in "pick me." I, I see uh, that uh, Holy Day of Opportunity resonated with someone there, uh, Father Deacon. That's, uh, I, I love that. All right, we have Brother Dominic as our winner uh, for, the, uh, for the Pick Me. And so, <clears throat> if uh, Brother Dominic, if you could uh, go to the uh, host and panelists uh, section and send me your address, and we will, we will get that out to you. So, thank you. Congratulations, Brother Dominic. Very good. All right. And just to remind everybody, because as much as Father Daniel and Father Deacon Anthony and myself love talking to one another, <laughs> if you have questions uh, on any of these topics on prayer in general, um, please feel free to post it in the chat and we will get to them um, as they come up. But by all means, uh, we'd like to share the driver's seat with our, our wonderful audience. So by all means, if you have questions, please do post them in the chat, because we are moving on slightly to talk more about the environment of prayer, specifically the church building. So there's a wonderful section in Christ our Pascha, it's uh, 579 to 614, which talks about uh, the church building, the architecture, the iconography, which for us as Eastern Christians, we have such a rich and unique tradition, right? When you look across the American landscape of churches, um, 
a lot of older churches, whether Catholic or Protestant, they look kind of the same. They can be nice, they can be not nice, but they look the same. Um, a lot of modern churches are not so nice. Um, but you go to a Byzantine church or an Orthodox church for the first time, and it's a completely unique and different experience than anything else on the American landscape. So as this is such a large section, um, it'd be nice to take this as Father Daniel, Father Deacon Anthony, pick one thing, one thing about Byzantine architecture, one thing about Byzantine art, one thing about Byzantine chant, something that particularly resonates with you, that's something that comes from your heart, something that you love, and just talk about it and describe it to our audience, what it means, how you became interested in it. Um, you could talk about the theology of it, um, but let's play a little fast and loose with the rules and, you know, <laughs> and make it about what, what resonates with you, what draws your heart to the East in terms of architecture, art, music. Father Deacon, you wanna go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, speaking on a broader level, I think what resonates with me is when you step into a, an Eastern church, um, you, you feel like you're stepping into a sacred space. And uh, I think that's key. You know, When you walk into one of our churches for the first time, it's very clear you're not in an auditorium. You're not in somebody's living room. You know, you're not in a bank. Uh, you're in a place of sacredness that's dedicated to God. There's a sense of sacred space. And so many things go towards that, the iconography, the icon screen, the architecture, all of that together leads to that. Um, but for me, uh, that always resonated with me. Um, you know, I grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition, which I still love. But one thing that saddened me was so many of the Roman Catholic churches I attended growing up, um, many of them in that time period looked more like auditoriums than like sacred spaces. Part of it was 70s architecture. Part of it was, um, you know, people wanting to make humans more of the focus of the liturgy. So they build churches almost like in the round or whatever. So you felt like you're at a community theater. Um, but the idea of, of there being a sacred space uh, outside of the norm of this world, um, to me, that was very appealing and it still is, still is. You know, recently a visitor said to, a visitor came to one of our churches for the first time, and he said, "Man, when you walk in here, you feel like you're like leaving the country. You know, you're like in a different world." I'm like, "That's the idea. You're no longer in you know modern day America. You're you're outside of space and time. I mean, that's what it's meant to evoke. And uh, to me, that's a beautiful and important thing. Uh, one thing I can't stand is when I go to churches and they try really hard to blend in with the world around them." You know, and uh, I understand there are some churches that take that approach. They have the, the trendiest music, you know, the trendiest architecture, modern art, all of that. I, I get it. Maybe for some people that works, but that doesn't speak to me. What speaks to me is something calling me to something greater than myself, calling me out of this world. And, and for me, that's really important. Father Daniel? Well, it's interesting because one of the most profound experiences that I've ever had uh, was uh, spending time in Japan. And I used to travel a lot to Japan for work. Um, went some, you know, dozen <clears throat> different times to, uh, to Tokyo. And there were two reasons why uh, that, those, that experience was so meaningful for me. One is that I did have a chance to visit some of the Shinto shrines in, uh, in Tokyo. And some of them are some of those beautiful displays of, of blending of, of nature and, you know, man-made architecture uh, that you'll ever see. And uh, w w one of the things that, um, now, of course, it's, it's classically pagan, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be um, syncretistic here. It's classically, but it speaks to something fundamental in each of us when you see something like that. So, so at the base of most of these temples or surrounding it, you have a garden. And then it leads to a peak. And at that peak, you have whatever Shinto deity is being, being worshipped there. Now, I wasn't offering worship to the deity, but I did, see, I did see the thing. And what I saw in that, I recognized as a fundamentally human and Christian intuition. And that is 
that a place that is holy, that is sacred, is meant to redeem the world around us. It's meant to be a place of revealed beauty and, and sacred beauty. And at the same time, it leads to a point. It leads to a peak, to an encounter, to a sacred encounter. Going back to creation, and we talked about this in that, uh, that initial webinar we did on how to attend a Byzantine divine liturgy. Every church is meant to be a liturgical mountain. Every church is meant to be an entry point where we are gradually led through a path of ascent to the mountain of God, to a holy encounter. And in that holy encounter, uh, you know, we are, we are experiencing the radiation, the, the, the radiating glory, not the radiation, but the radiating glory of the Lord. And we are participating in it. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, just so many aspects of our architecture which is a form of sacred iconography, you know, it, it's meant to lead from the narthex at the low, the low point to the, uh, you know, to the nave, you know, you're, you've got this gradual path. And then where do we call that place around the altar, which is the whole area behind the iconostas? We call it the high place. We go to the high place, right? It's, there's a peak, there's a liturgical peak, and it's there that we encounter with God. The whole of salvation history is all about encountering God on sacred mountains. The tabernacle in the wilderness was a portable Mount Sinai where God was Emmanuel prefigured in this tabernacle, traveling with his people on this sacred mountain eventually to lead them to Mount Zion, where he would establish uh, the tent of David, and then eventually uh, uh, the, you have the establishment of the temple. But the point is, it's meant to evoke something, uh, uh, this path of ascent which is a model for our spiritual lives. We should, we, should be, we should be walking up the mountain of God. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? You know, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. You know, and, and these are, this is where we want to dwell uh, with the Lord. And, and life, life in heaven will be that. So I, I think, I love the fact that we preserved the tripartite structure of a church we don't have churches in the round. We don't have any of these strange architectural things. We actually have a mountain, the mountain of God. And so when people are coming, they know they're there for a sacred encounter with the Lord. What about you, Robert? Um, well, I will say because it's fresh since I've moved from serving at the altar as kind of learning that future subdeacon role uh, to the Claire out to the Claros and helping with singing. Um, for me, it's been the singing, um, you know, and the fact that we use the voice alone as part of our liturgical worship. Um, to me, at, at, at first, you know, growing up Roman Catholic, um, it was very different, very different. I grew up with bad church music, right? church music that kept me grounded on earth um, and did not elevate. Um, and then experiencing, and I've, I've you know, been a, a number of parishes among priests and deacons of, and cantors of various skill levels. Um, but there is something about, there's something theological about using the voice, right? The breath that God gives you, right? And offering that that very breath in song to God. Um, that's really, it's beautiful. And especially when your parish has a, a really well-trained cantor and a, an excellent choir, um, liturgy is just so wonderfully elevated. We have a very experienced cantor at St. George and I admire him greatly. Um, he's been doing, he's been cantoring for 35 years um, and just, um, the way that he leads and the way that he kind of call, you know, um, I guess engages the community in song is just something really beautiful. And I think it's going to stick with me for a long time. I still can't sing. I'm still working on it. So, so pray for that part of my formation um, because I have no mu musical background. So it's a struggle, but um, it is a beautiful part of being Byzantine is, is the singing and the hymnography, especially during Holy Week and especially during the Paschal season. It's just wonderful. I love it when we sing Shine, Shine, O New Jerusalem. I, oh, 
I love it and I'm going to miss it now. So I'm with you hundred percent, Robert, um, the, the singing to me is also vital. It's vital. And, um, you know, a lot of our churches, especially emphasize congregational singing, right? Yeah. A really good cantor empowers the whole congregation yeah. to join in song. And that's really the goal for all of us to be singing. And for me, that's really important. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, I had severe ADHD. I still have ADHD, but I'm, I'm, I'm better with it now. But growing up, it was pretty bad. So when I go to the Roman Catholic Mass, again, I love the Roman Catholic tradition, but a lot of the parishes I went to, you know, most everything was recited. And, um, you know, you have these responses, and it was really easy for me to zone out. But when I go to an Eastern Catholic parish where everything was being sung, and the congregation was singing, um, if I was willing to take the chance to try and sing, which I would try, um, I found it much more engaging. It was like I felt much more as a participant than I did just uttering a few responses of spoken words. Um, the, the, the challenge and the joy of singing along really pulled me in a way that nothing else could. And also the fact that our musical tradition is so uh, beautiful and theologically rich it's sacred music. When you hear it, you know it's sacred. Even if it's being done in a parish where there isn't a great cantor or an awesome choir, if people are trying and they're you know somewhere within the realm of acceptable, it's a sacred experience. And uh, I think that's important. Again, too many parishes or too many churches try very hard to be modern, to be cool, to be with it. And that comes across as lame. And it, it turns people off. Remember a while back, uh, years ago, I saw this article about this, this new trend. They were trying to bring in young people by having what they called rave masses, right? You know what a rave is? Flashing lights, the techno music. This, some of these parishes were having rave masses to try and um, bring in young people. And I saw the photographs. I don't think there was a single person in the room who wasn't a baby boomer. Um, it had the exact opposite effect, right? Uh, when you try and be cool, when you try and be hip, when you try and be with it, you end up turning people off because if people want the things of this world, well, the things of this world are all around us, but things that are sacred, things that are beautiful, that's hard to find. And that's, what's appealing. If I could just add to that, I think one of the, the keys to doing it pastorally and going back to the, the horologion or doing the, uh, the daily or the even Sunday Vespers or Saturday evening Vespers and Sunday morning matins or Othros. Uh, some people, they try to do it all and it's discouraging for people. And uh, musically, sometimes some traditions are, are challenging. So you wanna start small. You, wanna, you don't wanna start pulling out all the stops because people will get discouraged. Uh, and, uh, and so we have such a rich, beautiful musical tradition, but you need to start simple. Um, and then work your way up. Like, you know, that's what we've been doing. We've gradually been working our way up to the different portions because that, that musical tradition, it also helps us to, uh, we need to accommodate ourselves to doing this kind of worship uh, because we're not used to, uh, always, we're not used to worshiping that way. And the musical tradition is so incredible. Uh, it, le it leads us to beauty, but it can be overpowering if we don't gradually allow ourselves to yeah. move into it. I know it's a little bit of a uh, segue, but I, but I, but I was thinking about that when you're talking about singing. Don't, don't try to do the whole, the whole thing. You know, come up with a, a small way to do it and work your way up. Yeah. And and kind of to continue on that thought, um, something that our tradition does very well in terms of encouraging participation right, is all the support ministries that a parish has, right? You have the pastor, hopefully you have a deacon, if not several deacons. Um, hopefully you have a subdeacon or two. You've got the servers, you've got the cantor, you've got the choir. You know, in terms of participation, you have all these various ministries that in a thriving parish, those are thriving ministries. In parishes that are liturgically minimalist, right? You have the pastor and he does everything, right? And maybe a cantor, right? But that's it. Um, but really what makes our church thrive in terms of being able to work up to offer more services during the week and on weekends is those thriving support ministries. So it's not all on the pastor's shoulders. 
Very, very good. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, we had Father Michael for a minute. Hopefully, we'll see him. We did. In, in the next couple of minutes. It was good to see that he landed safely and he's back at home anyway. So that's, that is good. <laughs> but we will keep plugging away. Um, he was just there to do his endorsement, and that was it. So <laughs> we'll take it. His cameo. We'll take it. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about vestments because that is another very unique part of the Eastern Christian experience that um, I remember as a uh, college student and then later on as a high school theology teacher um, attending the March for Life and going to the Vigil Mass for Life at the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in DC. It is a beautiful and moving experience. It's great to see that huge church, it's the largest church in North America, packed to the gills with young people, packed to the gills with clergy, right? And then you see all the priests process in, and they're all wearing the same thing. And then you see a couple of our guys who break up the sea of white, and you go, well, who's that? What's, why is he wearing that? And then you see a couple of our bishops come in. And that's just, wow, you know, with the crowns and everything, it's just, you know, as, as a Roman Catholic, you like, and, and teaching at a Roman Catholic uh, high school, all my students were like, who's that guy? Who's, you know, why is he wearing, I'm like, well, let me tell you. So let's talk about vestments. So maybe Father Daniel, if you want to talk about briefly the vesture of uh, priests and bishops, and then Father Deacon Anthony, the, the vesture of deacons, um, I think we'll be good. So Father Daniel. Well, yeah, we, we call it the, the Society of, of Men in Unusual Hats. Uh, it's usually the, what, what people, uh, and it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, vestments are, what are vestments? Vestments, vestments are the, the way that we reflect our consecration to, to Christ in the church. Um, and they're not comfortable. This is the one thing. Some people think, well, vestments, you know, you have nice vestments. It's all about your glory. It's like, you don't understand. No, no man, uh, you know, would, would ever want to say, oh, I'm going to put that on and walk around for three hours. And, you know, just, uh, you know, it's cumbersome, it's difficult, it's challenging. There's, there is an ascetical aspect to some of the vestment thing, but it's not for us. It's a form of iconography. It's, it's, uh, it's for, the, for the edification of the faithful. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, this is one of the reasons why I think, uh, although I won't get into the, the bishop's vestments specifically, I'll, t I'll say a few words about the priest's vestments, the vesting of the bishop when, when he visits his parish, when he goes to the vineyard of the Lord and he vests in, in public, in the nave, uh, and, uh, I was able to go, um, Father Hezekiah uh, Carnazzo, when I was uh, when I was a deacon, I went to his parish in Sacramento, and the patriarch Melchite patriarch was there, and so I was able to participate. He was very gracious; he allowed me to participate as a deacon in that process of vesting, in the, in the intercessions, and the different things that go on with the, the vesting, and the insensation, you know, with the bishop, and you, what you what you are seeing is the fullness of priesthood being revealed in the vestments. Now for a clergyman, vestments are things that are given to us at our ordination. The bishop will hold up and say, Axios, you know, hold up one of the pieces of vestments, Axios, he is worthy. And then people sing Axios or whatever the melody is. And uh, suddenly we're given the vestment to wear, right? You know, so, so not only in, in, the, in the laying on of hands in this moment of ordination, but in the vesting uh, just as when we are baptized into Christ, we receive the vesture of light, the garment of light uh, that signifies the interior change, this, the fact that we are now children of light, that, that garment that was lost to Adam uh, is, is now restored to us, that, that priestly, that royal priestly garment is now restored to us in baptism. And so that, that, that's an external sign of an interior change. Um, now that garment is actually the first garment over top of the cassock that a priest and deacon will wear. Uh, and it's, uh, it's called a stikarian. It's essentially a very ornate, depending on 
whether you're a deacon or a priest, it's usually less ornate when you're a priest, uh, baptismal garment. And, and what, it, what it says, so that first garment that a priest would wear signifies that I am a disciple first. Uh, it's like Augustine says, you know, um, you know, with you, I am a Christian. Uh, for you, I am a bishop. You know, for, so for the clergyman, with you, I am a Christian. For you, I am a priest. For you, I am a bishop. For you, I am a deacon. Uh, so, so that first garment is a baptismal garment. Uh, the second garment uh, that a priest wears uh, after his stakarian, and by the way, there are prayers that are, that are mentioned here. I'll just mention one about this stakarian. Um, it actually comes from uh, Isaiah chapter 61. And we know Isaiah chapter 61 because that's the reading that Jesus gives at, uh, in Nazareth at, uh, when, he, when he's given the scroll, he opens it up and he reads, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and announces this great jubilee, this great deliverance that's going to come and the good news that's going to be given to the poor and, and freedom to captives and all these things that are going to happen. One of the things that's noteworthy in there is the participation of the Gentiles in this jubilee. Uh, and uh, the, the Gentiles are going to participate, and God is going to renew the priesthood. Uh, all these things are happening. So this garment that we're given, the first garment, we're saying this prayer, and there's also a reference to us being bedecked uh, like a bride, uh, as well as adorned like a bridegroom. So there's a nuptial joy in the celebration of this jubilee that's given in the vestment. The second vestment is what's called the epitrachelion. This is the, the priestly stole. Um, so this is uh, the office of a presbyter. A presbyter will always wear this particular garment. It's usually adorned with seven crosses. The seventh one, the odd number is at the back and that's the one the priest kisses when he puts on his epitrachelion. Um, and uh, it symbolizes the, the spiritual yoke of the priesthood. Um, now this particular prayer is uh, usually, it used to be traditionally made out of lamb's wool. Uh, because, you know, we, we were supposed to be uh, shepherds, shepherding Christ's flock, but also uh, we're one of his flock. Uh, the, the prayer is from, from the Psalms, blessed be God who pours out his grace upon his priests, like precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, upon the beard, running down upon Aaron's beard to the hem of his very garment. It's meant to evoke the pouring down of, of sacred oil upon Aaron uh, and this anointing and it wasn't just the anointing of Aaron, it was the anointing of the whole tabernacle, it was the anointing of the vessels, it was the anointing of the altar, it was the anointing of everything, but especially the priest. The priest becomes the embodiment of the tabernacle. Uh, and, uh, that, and, and so there's an identification with the altar and the priest and the tabernacle and the priest. All these things are meant to be signified there. And then the, the last thing I'll mention, because I know Father Deacon Anthony is going to say some words about uh, probably the cuffs, uh, which, which are, are common to... Uh, the priest and the uh, and the deacon uh, is the uh, is the zone uh, and the felonian. So the the zone is a belt which secures. It goes around. It goes uh, actually over top of the upper um, and uh, and, uh, and 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 kind of keeps things secure. It's meant to remind us of you know girding our loins, preparing for work. It also keeps things out of our way. So our epitrachelion is a flowing everywhere in the wind. We, we keep the zone. But the prayer is, bless me, God, who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless, making my feet swift as the deers and setting me upon the high places. So there's a sense of God yeah. securing us in his redemption. Father, were you going to say something? No, I'm just happy I'm here. I can hear you. Oh, now. we're happy you're here too. <laughs> Welcome, Father. Great having you back with us. It I is. Start Absolutely. I started the meeting and Windows decided, no, you have an update that's much more important. So, oh. so I, I'm glad I'm here. Good. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's okay. That's right. It's great to have. Welcome to the high place. No. So, uh, yeah. So it's about it's about securing things for action. And then the last part, the Felonian, and uh, is the uh, is is a specific uh, specifically priestly garment. It's actually it's it's made from a twelve foot a twelve foot length of brocade. Uh, and uh, originated with the cape. Uh, there, was a, there was a cape that was a symbol of office that was part of it. Historically, actually, it was evenly cut around the front and the back, and then it would fold up. There were little hooks that you could fold up to free up the hands of the priest to minister, but during the other offices uh, where there wasn't the need to handle, you know, uh, the, the holy gifts or things like that, uh, it, would, it would just simply drape across the arms. So it was, it was, a, it was a common investment. 
but but what's noteworthy is the, is the uh, is the prayer. Your priests, O Lord, will be clothed with righteousness, and your saints will rejoice always, now and ever, and forever. Amen. This comes from uh, Psalm Psalm one thirty two, where the the prayer is: Let us go to His dwelling place. Let us worship at His footstool, saying, "Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place." You and the ark of your might, may your priests be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. And that's, these are the prayers that the priests are saying. So when you start to see the, these, the vesting, the act of vesting that you do as a, as a continuation of the gift of ordination, you're using these psalms and these prayers of the prophets uh, to recall the purpose uh, of the ministry that you're exercising in the church. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and because I know Deacon Anthony. a lot to add. Tell us sure, about sure. the deacon. Yeah, and uh, quickly to to build on what you said at the beginning, Robert, about you know the, the unusual people coming in with the with the vestments that are very different than everybody else, right? Um, I had an experience like this not long ago where it was the Annunciation, and that's when all of the bishops were doing the consecration of Russia. Remember that? And the uh, local Roman Catholic bishop, who's who's a friend of ours, who's been a good friend to our parishes, he invited my pastor and myself to come and celebrate with him at their cathedral. And big crowd. I mean, it was a huge crowd. The cathedral was standing room only. And there were all these Roman Catholic priests, all these Roman Catholic deacons. And they're all dressed, you know, in, in matching white vestments, you know, pretty simple, uh, but beautiful. And then my pastor and I come in, you know, wearing our very flashy blue vestments, you know, with uh, all the gold embroidery throughout it. And uh, we definitely stood out. We definitely stood out. And uh, the bishop, when he uh, was giving his homily, he said, Maybe wondering who the best dressed clergy are up here. He introduced my pastor and I explained about our you know Byzantine tradition. Um, but afterwards, it was kind of neat because uh, people were coming up and asking questions, and several people wanted to have their photos taken with me <laughs> because it just it was so different than what they had seen before. So uh, it, it does stand out, but that's a, a beautiful thing, I think. Um, but getting to specifically what deacons wear, um, as Father Daniel mentioned, we wear the Stakarian. Uh, but the deacon's decarian tends to be a bit more uh, decorative uh, because we have nothing over top of it. You know, you know it's, it's visible, so it tends to be more decorative, you know, thicker fabric, uh, usually has designs of some kind, pattern. Uh, and then we, of course, have the cuffs. Now, uh, I forget the, the Greek word, or I, I forget the pronunciation of the Greek word, I will say, but I'll call them cuffs, right? And those are symbolic because they, they symbolize that your hands belong to God. In a sense, you know, you're using your hands for God's purposes, whatever that may be. In other words, you're almost like a slave to God in a sense. You know, the, the idea of cuffs connects to the idea of being a servant or a slave in a sense. So it shows that we are carrying out God's will, whatever that may be. And then over top of it, we have a unique vestment distinctive of the deacon called an aurorian. And the aurorian is like a long cloth that goes over the shoulder. The origin of it is a little iffy. One theory I've heard is that it originated as a towel at one point uh, to kind of symbolize the towel that Christ used to wash the feet of the apostles. Um, but during the liturgy, the Aurorian is held up by the deacon. It's held up uh, whenever he's leading prayer or making an acclamation of some kind. Uh, symbolically, that's meant to symbolize an angel's wings, right? We see that in some of the church fathers. They talk about the deacon you know, lifting up his, his Aurorian like an angel lifts his wings to show the connection between deacons and angels. Uh, practically speaking, it may have come from a practice in, a, in the ancient Roman Empire that perhaps when somebody was speaking uh, in a formal event, uh, perhaps a, a government official would hold up like a, a piece of, of fabric or a, a piece of clothing to show that he was the one speaking. So it could come from that as well. But the Aurorian, you know, is, is kind of the deacon's thing to show that it's time to pay attention, it's time to listen, something important is being said. Um, and we wear a cassock under all of that. And I will say that it gets, it's not comfortable. Like you said, Father Daniel, our vestments are not necessarily comfortable. They can get pretty hot, especially when you're wearing, you know, regular clothing and then a cassock and then a heavy stakarian and then an aurorian and it's 90 degrees outside. Yeah, it's not necessarily comfortable, um, but it's important because it shows us something unusual is taking place, something outside the norm. If we stood in the sanctuary wearing regular daily clothing, um, that'd be saying this is a normal daily thing. Uh, but we're dressed in a way that's very unique and distinctive, and that shows us something out of the ordinary is taking place. A friend of mine put it this way. 
in our culture, whenever something important is happening, a man wears a dress. Uh, you know, judges, right? Graduation ceremonies. Um, the key thing is we dress out of the ordinary to show that something out of the ordinary is taking place. That's right. Very good points. Well, thank you for that tour of the vestry, gentlemen. That was very well done. Um, we have a question from Drea, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, which ties in very nicely with the last section that we're meant to talk about today, which is Christ our Pascha 654 to 703, so quite long, but really on how to develop personal prayer. Um, so, you know, it is a common Christian experience that we question, you know, whether we're praying correctly whether our prayer is effective. So what are some tips, I guess, to answer those existential questions that arise in our uh, life of prayer? Um, and I think it'd be nice to tie this into how do we integrate a daily rule of prayer? So anyone who wants to answer, maybe we hear from Father Michael since we haven't heard much from you yet. Do you want to un unmute, Father Michael? Yeah, thanks, sorry. There we are. Sure. Just a, a quick question, Robert. Are we are we at point C, or are we off off of that? Just so um, I'm a, I'm aware. Sure. Well, we we skipped down a little bit. So oh, okay, it, okay, yeah. So, so, so go ahead. Okay. So uh, I I'll um I guess to start a personal prayer uh, would be um it's just to start slow. You know, um, you know, you want if if you're, <laughs> this is the one thing. Somebody wants to pray, blessed be God. That's wonderful. They they want to uh, commune with God. Uh, you know, um, they want to praise Him, thank Him, and intercede for others and please God to come to a time in in their life where they be able to hear Him as well. Not necessarily. You know, I've never heard the Lord with my actually ears, but, you know, but to hear him in your heart. And the thing is to go slow, is to start off very slowly. I remember when I, when I uh, wanted to start a, my own, I'll call it a prayer rule, because I think it's a, it's a good thing to call it that, a prayer rule. Um, I wanted to, you know, have the opening prayers, add Psalm 50, have the prayers of repentance, take on the prayer of the elders of Optina, include this, 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 this. And my spiritual father said, whoa, those horses there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let, let's, let's, just get, um, let's just get you to do the opening prayers. You know, let's establish that for two to four weeks see how you do with that you know i'll, I'll share a little story this is a, a, a legend from mount athos a, an older monk ended up at mount athos i don't know where he was before he moved around to different monasteries but he heard about this this monk but people are going to because he's a man of prayer deep prayer and everything he's prostrating all day long doing the jesus prayer and everything like that so he made his way down to, to see him. And he, he met other pilgrims who said, oh, yes, we saw him doing all these and so forth, these prayers and frustrations. And uh, as he approached the house, he could see there's a crack in the door, the pathway, there's a crack in the door. And he saw him sitting, he saw inside the crack, this monk sitting on a chair who noticed he was approaching. So he got off the chair and started doing prostrations. The older monk called him out on it. He was faking it, right? And he said, I will return at a certain period of time, and I'd like you to do 10 prostrations a day. And when he did return, this monk came to the elder and says, I can't do 10. It's so hard. Like, like that is filled with prayer. Pr prayer, takes, prayer takes time. It's, uh, you need training wheels. You need other people to help you to know what to do. That's why a spiritual father, a spiritual mother is very good to, to help you with that. Uh, but there are some prayer books that even there be the help to help you start, you know, every every church has its own little prayer books. I use a, a few from from the Orthodox, some older ones, which have a from, you know, St. Tikons or, or from um, Holy Transfiguration, uh, and so forth that that both have Slavonic 
and uh, English together. Those are the first I started with. I, uh, the prayers touch me deeply. And, and to know that prayer also changes in your life. Your prayer rule will change as you are transformed and grow in the likeness of our Lord as you are deified. Please, please, God. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Father Michael. Yeah, some good, good first steps there. Um, we are swiftly running out of time, but I do want to talk about the Jesus prayer because that is something that as, as Eastern Christians, that in our regular rule of prayer, uh, many of us have integrated the Jesus prayer. So I wanted to ask Father Deacon Anthony, um, because I know you've spoken on various programs about the, the Jesus prayer. If someone just is getting started on the Jesus prayer, just a two minute, how do you get started? How many did you do? What do you think about? Do you not think about anything? just a basic catechism on the Jesus prayer. Yeah, for those who aren't familiar with it, the Jesus prayer is an ancient prayer that's recited, repeated again and again. There are different variations of it. A common one is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But it can be longer. I've heard longer versions. I've heard shorter versions. Uh, but the one I typically say is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's a prayer that has a certain simplicity, but also a certain power to it. First of all, think about what you're saying. You know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, you're calling upon the name of Jesus. That fact alone is powerful, right? You know, St. Paul says that, that when you call upon the name of Jesus, every knee on heaven and earth must bow. Uh, and then the second part, you're asking Jesus to have mercy on you, a sinner. And we have to understand what mercy means in our tradition. We've talked about this before. You know, in our Byzantine tradition, mercy isn't just forgiveness, it's healing. You know, we're, talking, we're asking for healing as well as forgiveness. Uh, but the idea is, if you say the Jesus prayer, and you say it again and again and again, it eventually becomes a part of you until the prayer is going on its own. Uh, it's almost like a, a boulder, right? You're pushing a boulder down a hill. It takes some effort to get it going, but once it starts rolling, it keeps rolling and rolling, and it becomes praying without ceasing. You know, St. Paul says to pray without ceasing, and this is one way of doing that, is by developing this habit of saying this prayer, and it becomes a part of you. I know a person who's been praying the Jesus prayer virtually nonstop, you know, for 40 some years. And uh, I'll sit down and have a conversation with him. And he's fully paying attention to everything that I'm saying. He's hearing every word. I mean, his, his mind is focused on me more so than most people are. You know, typically when you're talking to somebody, they're thinking about what they're gonna say in response. He's listening, but you can see his lips moving. He's saying the Jesus prayer. He's not thinking about it as, as a part of him. It just always is going. For some people, it's even going in their dreams. Uh, you know, it goes all the time. But how do you get started with it? Where would you begin? Um, I would not keep count. I know in The Way of a Pilgrim, which is an awesome book, you know, his, his elder has him keep count like 10,000 times or something. Uh, I wouldn't take that approach personally. Um, what I recommend doing is starting out with five minutes a day. Set a timer. Five minutes. Just sit down, make yourself comfortable, and pray it. And I like to use a rope myself or beads, because when you use a rope or beads, it gives your hands something to do, which makes it easier for me to focus. Like I mentioned before, I have ADD, attention deficit disorder. If I'm using a rope and praying with my hands, it's much easier for me to focus on what's taking place. So I'd recommend just beginning with five minutes a day, set aside for the Jesus prayer. But then throughout the day with whatever you're doing, um, jump into it whenever you can. And that's typically what I do. I usually wear a bracelet that's either prayer rope or prayer beads. And I have many opportunities throughout the day to, to pray, sitting in a, a doctor's waiting room, uh, attending a boring meeting at work, right? There are many opportunities to pray the Jesus prayer, but if just five minutes a day, if you start there, it'll eventually take root inside of you and it'll eventually grow. That's my experience at least. I'm sure you guys can add more to that. Beautiful. Father Michael or Father Daniel, some concluding thoughts? Go ahead, Father Daniel. Uh, well, the only thing I would add is uh, I, one, of the, one of the things I like to do uh, when I pray the Jesus Prayer is to take an open book of the Gospels and uh, lay them out uh, and maybe read, read a, a passage or two. You know, uh, But St. John Chrysostom says that Christ is present. He's truly present in the open book of the Gospels. 
Um, and so at that moment, I, I feel like Christ is present. And, and if I have an icon there, even better, you know, but if I don't have an icon, I have at least my open book, the gospels. And, and so for me, that helps me to be focused in my, in my prayer when I pray the Jesus prayer. Uh, so um, the other thing is, uh, I kind of going back to this idea of, of how we pray, St. Theophan the Recluse is one of my favorite guides in, in prayer. And when I've given spiritual direction, I, I'm always referencing him. He talks about when you pray, just take a few moments and come into the presence of God. And I think that's a good practice for praying the Jesus prayer. So to Father Deacon Anthony's point, you know, as you, as you say the name of Jesus, not only is every knee uh, on heaven and earth bowing, but uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church affirms that Christ is present in his name. Mm -hmm. His name becomes, in that sense, sort of a, a sacrament, a sign through which he, his presence is there. And so, you know, to come into the presence of God, be aware of his presence, to pray it, and then uh, to borrow from St. Theophan the Recluse, after we're done with prayer, he said, you know, carry it with us throughout the day. He said, like a, a mother who prepares a wonderful meal in the kitchen, and then the aroma spreads throughout the house. Prayer can be the same thing for you. And so you're, as you carry that prayer with you throughout the day, it's like carrying that aroma of that wonderful, you know, uh, banquet that you've had with the Lord of, of being in his presence uh, through his holy name. So there's some good images to think about and, uh, and so hopefully some practical tips. <laughs> I, I would add uh, to what father, the fathers have said, uh, just uh, something very small. I, I, an image is very good uh, of our Lord or the gospel book. But there, there's also, as you, as perhaps you might want to close your eyes at times, uh, the, the, the gospel book or the, the icon of our Lord will help to focus. But if you do close your eyes, you might find out that there's a lot of traffic inside. And, um, and it can be, that's why having an image before your eyes will help you to focus while you're dealing with that traffic. But I would say, don't be afraid of all the noise, the din, the background noise that's going on inside your mind and inside your heart. Actually, continuing to pray the Jesus prayer, you will be able to, there's a number of metaphors. They say you push through it. Or if the noise can be like a river, you grab onto a reed and you climb up above the noise. While the noise still continues, um, the focus is upon Christ. So that's something you may encounter as you start or you have been praying the Jesus prayer, not to be afraid, just to keep trusting in the name of our Lord, keep continuing for the agreed upon number or time, the amount of time and so forth. And uh, the Lord will, as Father Daniel said, the Lord is present, and he will see you through that, and he'll grace you. And um, over time, you'll look back and, you know, like that poem of footsteps, you go, wow, Lord, you've, you've carried me quite a distance here. Thank you. I think that noise, Father, is called uh, adoration deficit disorder. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I, think that's, I think that's what it's called. Very good. Uh, we need to oh. come up with a, you know, a primer of uh, Eastern Catholic um, acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, on that, we're going to land this plane, um, but we're going to give away a book first. All right, since I am the uh, appointed, let's see. Uh, so why don't you say, pick me? And uh, there we go. We've got some already in there. And you can do it more than once because I have a certain number in mind. So you just keep, keep doing it if you want. <laughs> All right, Greg, you are the winner. Uh, Greg, if you could uh, send us uh, in your host and panelist uh, message or the chat there, just go ahead and send us your contact information and your um, mailing address. That would be great. My Congratulations, wife, Greg. My wife has a whole 
Uh, you can actually not in the every, everyone uh, space, but in the uh, the hosts and panelists. My wife has a stack of all of our ones to send out, so we're we're ready to go. So we'll add you to that list. Excellent. Very good. Congratulations to Greg again. And thank you to all of our panelists. This was a whirlwind, covered a lot of ground. Um, so a lot, a um, lot of content and a lot of good, wonderful conversation as always. So we invite our participants to join us next month. Our next webinar is on June 26th. Um, unfortunately, I will not be here. I will be in the wonderful uh, realm of the Byzantine Catholic Seminary for my last beginning my fourth year of the deacon formation program so please pray for me and my brother deacon candidates as we head to the seminary for the last two weeks of June I appreciate it thank you very much and uh, as always thank you Father Daniel Father Deacon Anthony Father Michael um, always wonderful to be with you all and wonderful to be with our attendees. So thank you very much for joining us. God bless you as we conclude this Paschal season. Father Daniel, would you lead us in a concluding prayer? I will, but before I do, I just want to mention uh, that the YouTube videos, uh, Father, uh, Father Michael's wonderful lessons uh, at a detailed dive, a more, a more detailed dive, uh, roughly uh, 18 to 25 minutes for each lesson is now on YouTube. Um, and uh, we've got the ones for this week, so we'll be uh, posting this early, so you'll get uh, not only the webinar, but also the continuing lessons, which you can use for your own edification and deeper dives into, into the Catechism, Christ or Pascha, so I just want to at least mention that, so. Awesome. All right, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with the Ambon prayer for the Sunday of the man born blind. Blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, and forever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, joy-giving light of the eternal Father, you enlighten the man born blind by forming clay to spread on his eyes and commanding him to wash. Cleanse us of our sins by the washing of regeneration. Guide our steps in the path of your commandments and lead us into the new heaven and the new earth of your blessed promise. You have made us partakers of your mystical supper this day. Keep us in your holiness so that we may always confess you as Lord and not come to judgment. For you are a God of mercy and are glorified together with the Father and the all holy good and life creating spirit now and ever and forever. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you all again. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.